Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. And today we are joined by Becky Kalimnik and Diana Doty, the hosts of the podcast Homespun Haints, because as they say in the tagline, everyone has a ghost story. And who better to join us for our Halloween episode than the hosts of my favorite spooky show, Diana and Becky. Thank you so much for being here. Yay. Thank you so much. That was such a warm introduction. Yes. I'm so thrilled to be here. Well, we brought you here to share some ghost stories, but also, you know, talk about the concept of ghosts in general. But to sort of lay the groundwork with everyone, maybe each of you could take a turn telling us a little bit about your background and where this interest in ghosts comes from for each of you. Who wants to go first? Well, Becky's path is much more clear and mine is much more meandering. So Becky, why don't you start? Okay, I will begin. Well, I grew up in rural Appalachia in East Tennessee, where ghosts were just a part of life. We didn't have a lot of entertainment options there. It was a very poor area. It's not like bands came through for concerts and we only got maybe a portion of the movies that the rest of the world saw. So the way we entertained ourselves was with stories. Storytelling is part of the culture there. It's just as important as our bluegrass music and our strange instruments that we make out of washboards and saws. And I missed it. I missed this idea of getting together with your friends and telling stories and practicing stories and having the way you tell a story being as important, if not more important than the content of the story itself. And the types of stories that I love the most were the ghost stories. I've always been one of those weird spooky kids. I was Wednesday Adams as a child. I mean, I didn't look like it, but I was in my heart. <laughs> and I just adored ghost stories and thought everybody had one, as is our tagline. As you mentioned, everybody has a ghost story. And when I moved away from that area, I asked my standard question of everybody I met, have you seen a ghost? When was the last ghost you saw? Tell me a ghost story. And I got strange looks. And I realized that maybe not the whole world has been exposed to this. We need to expose the world to this wonderful thing of oral storytelling, oral art of storytelling. It's an art mixed with terrifying tales. And that's kind of my background. And yes, I've seen some ghosts, of course, because I think everybody has if they really think about it. Then I'm going to turn things over to Diana and let her tell a little bit about how she came on this path with me. If you really think about it. <laughs> I did have to really think about it because I'm the, I'm not sure how I feel about ghosts person in the ghost host realm that we cohabitate. But I grew up in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where if you tell somebody, hey, I've got a ghost story, they'll say, I'll pray for you. <laughs> they don't want to hear it. And I was also the spooky kid in Outlier within my community as well and that was all i wanted to do was make people laugh in a dark macabre way so i guess i was the morticia of the the family i suppose <laughs> but it, it just brought me so much joy to make people laugh in a creepy spooky way and there were so few people around that were open to that when i was a kid and so i moved to new orleans as soon as i could thinking well it doesn't get more haunted than new orleans and then noticed as i was there that the south really does take ghosts very very differently than the midwest and i didn't really find my stride there either so when becky approached me with this idea for a ghost story podcast i said i think you need a co-host to make it <laughs> hilarious because <laughs> if it's just ghost stories that's great but if it's ghost stories and horrible macabre jokes that's even better right and she said all right <laughs> I, well, I, well, as I recall, I think uh, I recorded an episode and sent it to you and you were like, this sucks. It didn't you, suck. You need humor. <laughs> it just wasn't hilarious. That's all. It did. She made it so much better. <laughs> and uh, what it started out, she was like, let me just try recording with you. We'll see how it goes. And before we know it, here we are um, three years later, four seasons later and going strong. That's great. So what do you think it is about the ghost story itself, the element of the creepy within the storytelling that draws you rather than say you you tell me uh, fairy tales at a library? Well, ghost stories have 
an element of the unknown. And that's where the fear comes in, is the unknown. People are afraid of things they don't understand. And with ghosts, some things you just can't understand. We just don't have enough knowledge and we won't until we're dead. So there's that unknowing creepiness to it. And it also messes with everything that we learned about how the world works. We've seen people who have had epiphanies while they're talking to us. And you can just see, it's like their entire worldview shifts. And they're like, oh, and everything that they thought they knew has changed. And now they have to look at the world completely differently. And a good ghost story will do that to you because it throws information at you that just messes with you in a really fundamental way. But in a good way, if you're open to it, if you, if you like that scary factor to it, I think it challenges you too. And it one thing that we like about ghost story formats as well is because it gives us a chance to really explore what it means to be human and how we view the world. We view it through a lens of something that's unknown and unknowable. It really forces you to kind of look at yourself. I think it really helps you to like look at some really deep questions and analyze yourself as a person and your own beliefs and why you have those beliefs. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that while you were saying that I was thinking some people would say that they'd seen angels, not ghosts mm -hmm. in that same realm. So is it possible that you're tuned in certain directions as well? Oh, oh maybe yeah. just interpretation wise too, because some people will say there's no such thing as ghosts It's all demons impersonating ghosts. We've heard that. Yes, definitely. Uh, some people say they've encountered angels. Other people refer to them as spirit guides. Some people say they're aliens. But yeah, you're, even things that you see with your own eyes are going to be biased through your own experiences, your culture, your beliefs. You're never going to not have that bias. That's also one of the fascinating things about hearing people's stories is how people interpret what they've seen. Oh yeah. That's the best. That's yes. the best is when, you know, you never know whether somebody's going to tell a story and then be like, I don't know. I just can't, ex I don't, maybe it was this, maybe it was a ghost. I don't know. And this, you never know if they're going to be like, oh no, this is exactly how ghosts work. Ghosts are blah, 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 blah. And you're like, <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Me, I'm okay with the mystery. I love yes. the mystery. Yes. Well, maybe, maybe we should have you each tell us have you both encountered ghosts? Do you want to tell us a oh, story yeah. of what did you see? What 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 happened? <laughs> Ooh, who wants to go first? You have your most recent. Well, no, we've both encountered ghosts pretty recently. So, okay. I When I was growing up, I, I am currently living in the same house that I grew up in because I'm helping my mom kind of renovate it. And so when I was a kid, I was absolutely convinced that the basement had some spooky entity that would follow me up the stairs as I was leaving. And I never really told anybody about it. I was kind of a loner as a kid. And I, I, again, I just, I embraced the mystery. I'm like, well, I can't explain this, but I seem to be safe enough upstairs. And then as a teenager, you know, I, I thought it was cool when I was painting my bedroom upstairs to move into the basement and sleep there for about a year. I was creepy, so it was perfect for me. And while I was sleeping down there, I would have dreams from this perspective of a different part of the basement, as though I was witnessing through the eyes of somebody moving towards me in my bed. So astral projection, out of body, strange dream, I don't know. But it was it was a creepy emotional experience. But every time when I woke up, I would just brush it off. Oh, whatever. It's fine. I'm sorry, this only happened to you when you were sleeping in the basement? Yep. And only at this house. I was probably about 13, 14 this year that I slept in the basement. But anyway, so, I, you know, I had some other haunted experiences in my teen years that really, really kind of blew anything that I experienced in my basement out of the water. So I didn't really think about it. When we started this podcast, we would tell our own stories waiting for guests to apply to tell stories. We started telling our own stories and it really never even dawned on me to tell a story about my haunted basement because it just wasn't that haunted. You know, it's not that big a deal. When we started to record this podcast and I moved back into my childhood home, we really did notice some very creepy things kind of happening when I would record next to the basement stairs. And when we'd speak to mediums, psychic mediums, they would tell me 
kind of off camera in a non showy way, just, oh yeah, there's, there's a spirit of a woman behind you, you know, well, that's where the basement stairs are. <sighs> um, <laughs> you know, just, just kind of like little tidbits of, hmm, interesting. And then I asked my mom about it, of course, because I never really talked to her when I was a kid. And she said, well, like, you know, another little boy, my, my friend's son came over and swears that he, was looking down through the floor. This is a 1930s house. So down through the floor grate, he could see the basement and he swears up and down that Mickey Mouse was down there talking to him through the floor grate. Uh, I never heard that story before. I didn't hear that till I was an adult. So that kind of shocked me. And I was like, okay, so we have one person who also gets communication from the basement in a strange way as a child. Maybe it's a childhood thing. I don't know. Through speaking to various mediums psychic mediums that we met through the show i've kind of pieced together some more details and some of the creepier details i had dreams about and then a psychic medium would tell me those details after i had dreamed that without me sharing the dream oh, so it's it, creepy I had lots of bizarre <laughs> little serendipities like that i was down there doing laundry because the washer dryer is down there and i had felt a prickly crawling fingernail sensation on the back of my neck. And because we were deeply embroiled in this podcast, we just had a guest who said, my father, who's a religious leader, told me that if I ever got bothered by a ghost, all I had to do was tell them to leave and they have to leave. And so, you know, I'm getting this creepy feeling. I'm getting a little freaked out. And I said, you have to leave. And I heard, <laughs> And I was like, was that one knock for no or one knock for yes? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. And I run oh up the stairs. Uh, um, so that that happened. And then I'm already slightly beginning to be a little afraid, a little trepidatious every time I go down in the basement at night that I'm going to get little fingernails on my back of my neck or knocks or strange noises or have strange dreams about this. <laughs> but I still have to do my laundry. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to be in laundromats. I must do my laundry in my basement. So I was, again, at the washing machine pulling wet laundry out of the washer. And I had pulled a scarf, a delicate scarf out, and I didn't want to dry it. So I flipped it up and I put it on the clothesline, which runs between the washing machine and the, the under staircase portion of the basement. And as the scarf is fluttering gently down onto the clothesline, I look down and I see a pale, dirty, nude pair of children's feet <gasps> underneath oh my the scarf. Oh, and instantly my heart rate is a million and I pull that scarf down as fast as I can. And there's nothing there. Have you ever researched the history of this home? I have. Yes. And it, 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 I mean, there's no record of anybody having passed away in the home. There's no record of any violence that was ever recorded. However, the land in Oklahoma has been inhabited and or traveled through by tribes for, I, I think, estimated about somewhere around 20,000 years or something like that. So there's probably been some trauma and or death on the land. And the fact that I'm only finding this in my basement hmm. and it doesn't seem to inhabit the upstairs part of the house at all makes me wonder if it's something to do with the land. Now, having seen those feet, do you now regret sleeping down there as a 13 or 14 year old or since it worked out at the time? I mean, I'm here, so <laughs> it's not too much to regret, I suppose. Uh, would my life be different if I wasn't haunted? I don't know. <gasps> Everything but... is content. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Oh, it's good for the podcast. Um, so I'm still skeptical. I, I'm still not certain that what I saw was a ghost. I mean, I'm okay with the mystery, like I said. Oh, man. But that's like, I mean, I don't talk to a lot of people who have ghost stories like you guys do. To me, that's like the best ghost story I've ever heard one on one, like from an actual person, from their personal experience. I read a lot of ghost stories. I just finished Edith Wharton's ghost stories. How nice. But it's different to hear it from somebody who actually lived it. And I'm like, wow. I mean, if that happened to me. I'd be a believer 100%. I mean, I, I already pretty much am, even though I've never experienced it. Um, I'm, I'm, I've always kind of believed in ghosts, would you but I'm curious if so, you meant, sorry, would you move? Would I move yeah. if I thought my house was haunted? 
no, 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 no. I think that would be cool. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I guess it depends on the ghost. I watched that series called The Haunting of Hill House. Oh, it's so um, good. Yeah. That would be a ghost worth moving for. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Katie can tell you, I was texting Katie some nights and being like, I am sleeping with the light on. Like <laughs> I would, that show scared me so bad, incredibly bad. And if so, if it was that kind of a ghost, really scary, menacing ghosts. Yeah, no, I would definitely move out. But if it was like a friendly ghost or just like a neutral ghost, I think I could cohabitate with a ghost I think I would find it I mean and especially if it's like like a small apartment in Rome <laughs> if I was in a huge house in the in like the middle of rural Oklahoma with a huge scary basement maybe not but like my <laughs> very contained apartment on a busy street in Rome I feel a little bit safer in somehow <laughs> but I wanted to ask you because you mentioned 20,000 years people have been living on this land probably some trauma happened here and you said you know you didn't know any stories in your house of anyone dying or, you know, being hurt or something. Is it necessary to become a ghost to have some kind of traumatic life and or death? That's a theory. That I is mean, a theory. <laughs> we yeah. don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, a lot of people believe that. Yeah. I mean, in your experience, like, is it more common? I know you're not going to have definitive answers for me, but is that, is it usually when you hear about ghosts, is it usually something violent, something traumatic? that has happened something important yeah. something significant that what that in human history that would have been mostly trauma yeah i mean and, and some of the most haunted places especially in the u.s are civil war battlegrounds and civil war hospitals because there was so much trauma and it wasn't just the the death that was taking place but just the you know the divide of the country it's, it's like levels and levels and levels of trauma so yeah we definitely do see more and more stories about that kind of thing. There's also stories where it's, you know, maybe somebody has like really strong religious convictions in life and they're worried in death that they're going to go to the wrong place. And so they're like hanging on oh. and being like just continuing to haunt. There's all sorts of reasons, but I think Diana said it best. It's something important, a reason why. You hear a lot about unfinished business, trauma, worrying or or sometimes somebody's looking for someone that they don't realize is also passed and so they're hanging on waiting for somebody trying to find them that's another thing it, just the idea that they don't realize that they've gone this is why places that have been burned down and rebuilt are more haunted than hospice wards where they're kind of at peace and expecting to pass on whereas that you know you can call it a trauma having an unexpected death mm -hmm. yeah right Interesting. That makes sense. My personal experience with my basement, the dreams that I've had indicate that the entity that's there experienced some very traumatic death and that there are two entities. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel a little woo saying this as though I'm some expert. I just, this is my dreams and this is what I've gotten from the psychic mediums that have spoken to me about it. But there are two entities. They're both female. They may be Asian or Native American entities based on what has been described physically to me and what I see in my dreams. However, I definitely get the feeling that there is a teenage girl and an older female caretaker and that the girl is trapped due to trauma and that the caretaker is there voluntarily to be with her. Now, what Diana has failed to mention is there's also a secret passage on her stairway, which she's never opened. What? That's what? right at where <laughs> she always feels like fingernails on the back of her neck when she walks up the yeah. stairs at that point. And I am convinced she's going to open it up and there's going to be like a skeleton hand or a ring or something in there that's like. <laughs> okay, yeah. Here's what I want to do. Next Halloween, you guys come back on the show and we open it live. <laughs> I would love that. Yeah, that's the plan. Well, yes. the original plan was I was going to be out there for Halloween. We were going to do that. But mm -hmm. then we just decided on Atlanta instead because we do have more ghosts here. That's but... true. <laughs> and children. Yes. Well, how interesting that uh, that you've never opened it. Right. How do you know there's a secret passageway there if you've never opened it? You can see it. There's like an, a board nailed to the wall and painted over and then wallpapered over from the other side. 
Mm. So I wasn't allowed to open it when I was a kid. I grew up there for 17 years. So it just kind of felt natural not to open it when I moved back in. I mean, why would I open it? And then Becky's like, because it's incredibly haunted and there's dead things in there. So, you know, <laughs> it's probably going to be like the the door in Coraline. You're going to open it up and there's going to be another world with everybody has buttons for eyes. That would have made me so happy as a child. <laughs> I'm reading that right now. Literally <laughs> right now. I'm reading that to Aurelio. Oh. <laughs> If this were a, you know, a teenage sort of YA story, there would be a room in there that had been boarded up because there had been some horrific act that had happened there. And the yes. people who had lived there before did not want to just even have anything to do with that space. Wouldn't that be nice? Right. Yeah, that would be great. And then I could go <laughs> in there and it'd be like Narnia or the secret garden or something. But no, actually. Or at least you'd get a whole new room. True. Okay, now I'm getting House of Leaves vibes. Yeah, <laughs> this is another scary book. <laughs> Unfortunately, this secret passageway merely goes from one side of a wall to the other side of a wall. So it's only wall width and it's maybe two feet by two feet so I that you can see. see unless there's a staircase going down between those two <gasps> those two oh, just a tiny <gasps> staircase like six inches wide mm -hmm. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> you know i i interviewed a a beachcomber once a professional beachcomber that's my mom's dream job oh please, people do this <laughs> believe it or not that's cool uh but they told me that of course one of the most coveted things to find is a message in a bottle but he also told me that m the vast majority of people who find a message in a bottle do not open it. Why? That was exactly my reaction. Why? Why would you open it? That would be, I, that would be the first thing I'd be trying to get that note out. Right? And he's like, because the, the message in the bottle, having it in there is more valuable as a beachcomber than it is to know what the message says. And I'm like, well, what if there's a person stuck on an <laughs> island? <laughs> <laughs> Please help. Look what I found. <laughs> but to me, that kind of reminds me of this door. It's for whatever reason. You 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 know it's there and you're curious about what's in it, but you're purposefully not opening it. Because it might even be more disappointing if you find that the that the note inside is just blank or something after years of being washed away. Mm -hmm. We'd like to talk to you about your car warranty. Yes, exactly. Something like that. All right. Well, what about you, uh, Becky? Do you, you've seen a ghost as well? Oh, my goodness. So many. Um, <laughs> I love that it's so many. Like, most people are like, I haven't seen anything. No. Not a single well, thing. Well, go, I go seeking about. And the most, most recently actually was a couple weeks ago. My family is still ticked at me for this. So <laughs> I was in charge of planning and making an itinerary for our trip to Ireland. I was like, even though we're staying in Dublin, I want to rent a car and drive up to the Giants Causeway. And it's kind of a long drive. And anybody with kids knows that every road trip is double the time when you have kids. I know. And add on to that driving on the other side of the road and trying to figure out the kilometers to miles per hour conversion and <laughs> telling the kids to be quiet so we don't crash because we don't know what the hell we're doing. It was kind of a stressful journey. So we decided we were going to stay the night in Northern Ireland. And the way I went about it was, oh my gosh, we're staying in rural Northern Ireland. I'm going to look for the creepiest, most haunted looking, oldest place I can. And I went on Google Maps. I saw where the Giant's Causeway was and I just went, oh, okay, there's, there's a place there. It's not too far away. It's pretty close by. And I just, it was just on Google Maps and I went to the website and it said it was a bed and breakfast. And I called the owner on her cell phone and booked us a couple rooms because each room only has one bed. And I looked at the pictures that they had online and I saw that there were some ancient castle ruins in the backyard. And I said, okay, this looks like the place. When we arrived, we went to the Giants Causeway. We had a good time. It's beautiful. I highly recommend it. Everybody should go there at some point before they die. As we're driving back, these small, tiny rural roads, lots of sheep, lots of cows. We get to the turnoff for the place that I had booked. And it is a small gravel road. At some point, my husband looks at me and says, what are you getting us into? And I was like, oh, it'll be fine. So we drive up and it is a 300 year old Georgian home with crenellated 
stone walls on either side of it, like complete, you can't see anything in the back. It's just these, like a walled garden behind it and like some cottages and ruins and things on either side. And I see one of the cottages has smoke coming out of the chimney. So I say, okay, good. Somebody's here. But I look around and I notice there's no other cars. We are the only car there. And of course, then of course, my husband is saying again, are we in the right place? And my son, he's nine, he was loving it. He was like, mom, this looks great. And I stopped the car and he jumps out and he's just running around having a great time. My daughter peeks her head out and says, mom, I don't like this place. I can feel them watching me everywhere. How old is your daughter? He is 11. And I'll admit, I felt it too. I consider myself quasi sensitive. Like if I walk into a super haunted place, I know it's super haunted, but I'm also not one of these people that's constantly seeing ghosts right and left, contrary to what it might sound like on the podcast, but I felt them. I felt them immediately. I was like, oh, there is something here. The air just felt heavy, old. The air felt old. And we went to the front door and somebody greeted us and it was a very nice man who worked there and he brought us in and he was showing us around and the whole place was decorated and and I mean rapiers on the walls and old muskets and antlers of every animal you can imagine and paintings and chairs that would have a rope across them if you saw them in a museum just the whole place was like that and he took us into the drawing room and he said you can hang out here as long as you want you're the only ones here. And I said, no other guests? He's like, no, nope, not tonight. And I said, well, what about the staff? And he said, well, they live in the cottages next door. If you need anything, they'll be here right away. But the house is yours. Oh, my gosh. And my daughter's about to crawl out of her skin. She's just like, mom, I don't like this. Mom, I don't like this. And again, my husband is looking at me like, what? What are you doing to me? And I'm like, you wanted me to plan a trip. You know what I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> so the the owners show up lovely couple the place has been in their family since the 1700s when their ancestors purchased it and prior to that it had been a castle the ruins were still there and the castle had burned to the ground in 1586 there had been two warring families in the area the mcquillans and the mcdowells and the mcquillans had lived in the castle and they were marrying the McDowells to try and soften the wounds, bring the families together. And the McQuillan bride was set to inherit maybe 20,000 acres. It was a huge chunk of land. So at the wedding banquet, the McDowells swooped in and killed everybody and then burned the castle to the ground. And then they built this beautiful home on top of it. So oh, geez classic when the couple come in that own the place i asked about the history they told us the story of the castle and some of the things that they do at the the house and it's called ballylock house i forgot to mention that it's in bush mills in the uk part of ireland and northern ireland well after we talked for a while i asked june the owner i said is this place haunted and she turned to me with a glint in her eyes and she said Oh, but you can't you feel him? They're everywhere. <laughs> and she told me the story of the white lady and the gray lady. The white lady is the slaughtered bride and the gray lady is her mother. And you see them if a death is about to occur. <laughs> oh, God. And I said, oh, okay. Because my, again, my daughter's like freaking out. My husband's looking at me like, why are you asking this in front of the kids? And and I said, okay, so all the ghosts are outside the property, right? And she's like, well, people have seen things inside the house. I said, oh, okay. And she said, in fact, the room where you're sitting in, one of our guests came in once, the lights were out. And so she walked into the room and she saw a little boy sitting at a dining table. Well, as you can tell, this isn't a dining room. It's the drawing room, but it used to be the dining room. So this woman had seen, I don't know, some kind of echo. Then we go upstairs to go to bed a storm broke out outside oh, as it would of Classic. course it needs to. <laughs> the wind is howling the windows are shaking in their 300 year old panes and they put us in a room with two beautiful picturesque windows looking right out onto the castle ruins 
they were like, if you're going to see her, you'll see her out those windows. And then they put my children in the room across the hall. Now, as we were getting ready for bed, as we were heading up, as the owners were leaving for the night, June is her name. She says, oh, which room did the kids get? And I said, they're in Shane's room. And she said, oh, good luck with that. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Things were pretty uneventful for most of the night. My husband did give me a talking to. He said something along the lines of, you could have picked anywhere in Northern Ireland. Why are we here? And I said, 12th century castle ruins in the backyard. Hello. You're not going to get that at the Hilton in Belfast. He still had a hard time accepting it. And he was cold because it was an old building. And I said, that's why there's a fire in the fireplace. But, you know, complaining, complaining. We go to bed. We're in our room. We leave the door unlocked. And then the kids are in their room and they also have the door unlocked, but we're the only ones in the building. So I figured it was safe to leave the doors unlocked. Around two in the morning, I hear our old door creak open. And I start flailing about because I'm like, we're the only ones in this place. Maybe it's my husband. I'm like, oops, sorry. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> I'm like, banging on him on the side of the bed. Is he is he still there? Maybe it's him. No, he's still there. And I'm like, who is it? Honey, wake up. Someone's in the room. Someone's in the room. It was my daughter. Hopefully. <laughs> and she said, Mommy, someone was walking around my bed. I heard footsteps. And then I heard them in the hallway. And I jumped up and I opened the door and no one was there. And I said, of course, no one's there. We're the only ones in the house. And then I said, the wind is shaking, the window panes. You probably just heard that. She said, no, mom, I know what footsteps sound like. These were footsteps. Someone was in my room. And I said, oh, I'm so tired to deal with this. Just crawl into bed next to me, whatever. And my husband says, okay, I'll go and sleep in the other room with our son. And then about an hour later, I woke up because I felt like a cat had jumped on my feet. And I thought, oh. The cat's here. Cat always jumps on my feet when I sleep. And then I thought, wait, the cat's 3,000 miles away in Atlanta, and I'm in another country. What's on my feet? So it's pitch black. And I reach up with my foot to try and see what I'm feeling. And I felt what felt like tweed, like a tweed pair of pants on my feet. And I'm like, oh, okay, someone's sitting on my feet. But I'm still not convinced. I'm like, it could just be my imagination. I'm half asleep. And I'm trying to get myself back to sleep. But I'm like, oh, that's like, I mean, there's a weight on my feet. This is weird. And it was there for maybe about, I don't know, it didn't feel like that long, maybe five or 10 minutes. And I'm starting to convince myself it's not really there. I'm not, I'm just feeling things because it was kind of squishy feeling. Like I couldn't tell how solid it was. And then suddenly, whatever it was, stood up and the weight was gone. And I thought, oh, okay, that was real. That, that, was, that was real. That was real. Someone sat on my feet. Okay. Well, went back to sleep. I was like, oh, yeah, place is haunted. No big deal. Woke up the next morning and my husband comes in and he says, so did you see any ghosts last night? And I started to tell him about what I felt, somebody sitting on my feet. But then I caught myself. Because that's not the kind of question my husband asked me. He does not give a flying flip about ghosts. So I turned to him and I said, why? What did you see? And he said, well, because he's, he's kind of got this like look in his eyes, like, like he's not paying any attention to what I'm saying. And he's just kind of like staring into space with like this wild look in his eyes. He said, at 5.45 a.m., our son sat up straight in bed. And he reached over to see what was going on. And my son was ice cold, which is weird because they had been under a down comforter together. So they should have been nice and toasty and warm. But he sat right up in bed and then fell back down and went to sleep like nothing happened. And then he was warm again. So my husband just kind of was like, okay, that was weird. I guess he's fine. And as he turns to go back to sleep, he looked at the foot of the bed and he saw a little head pop up. (gasps) <gasps> at the foot of the bed it stayed there for a minute and then it went back down again oh my god <gasps> this is your husband who is not a ghost person 
does not let his imagination run run wild with him. No, he's an engineer. And <laughs> okay. everywhere we go, something happens to him and it doesn't happen to me. And I get all mad and he gets all scared, but then he somehow like pretends that it didn't happen. <laughs> so anyway, we, we went to breakfast and first thing our hostess asked us was, so did you see any ghosts? And I told her what happened and she did not bat an eye. No surprise. I mean, usually when I stay in a haunted hotel here in the States and I tell people about my experiences, they're like, oh, oh, cool. Oh, that's awesome. Can we talk about it? Uh, you know, for it? No, nothing, nothing. Just like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then she says, sounds like they liked you. They must have heard you're spooky people. <sighs> like this is completely normal. This is so normal. I love Ireland. I mean, I, that made me fall in love with that place instantly. <laughs> Yeah, so husband's still a little pissed at me, but I'm really excited that we got to stay in a haunted bed and breakfast and actually experience ghosts. It was very cool. It's amazing. I want to go there now, <laughs> except I'll probably be too scared too. I want to ask you, especially because your daughter had that such a strong reaction immediately. Do you guys think that certain people are more sensitive to these spirits than others? And is there a way to heighten our sensitivity if we've never experienced a ghost? Like, what can I do? I mean, I mean, the most haunted city in the world, practically. Like they say the Coliseum is the most haunted place in the world because so many people died so tragically there. But like, what can I do? I've never experienced it. Well, absolutely. Some people are more sensitive than others, um, according to quote unquote experts, and we've seen that too. There definitely are people who we talk to a lot of people, they've had one experience. And then we talk to people that it's like, they can't even go to work in the morning without running into a ghost. It just, they're just everywhere. <laughs> they're like the kid from the sixth sense. It does seem to be genetic. There's been a little bit of people have tried to do research, like actual geneticists have tried to do research to see if it's genetic to find some marker for it. But um, I don't know if it's nature or nurture because if you grow up in a family where you're more open to it, you're going to be more willing to accept what you see, I think, and try to than trying to come up with other explanations. But I think it's just like anything else. Like some people are born more inclined to play a musical instrument or more gifted in math. And some people have what we call in the South, the gift, and they just see things. But the consensus is that everybody can develop it just like everybody can learn a musical instrument. Even if you don't have that so-called natural talent, you can still learn how to do it if you're willing to put in the time. Which is a lie because there are certain brain anomalies which would make it absolutely impossible to learn a musical instrument, Becky. Well, if you and have so, music. <laughs> no, this is my point. Broke that, us a musica, yeah, but. Yeah, exactly, or a severed corpus callosum. But anyway, this is my point. This happens when I have there, a scientist on the show. There are probably, <laughs> and there have been studies demonstrating that there are likely sections of your brain that can be stimulated that make you feel haunted when they're stimulated by electricity. Mm -hmm. And so you would think that perhaps people who see more ghosts have more activity in this portion of their brain, or they have uh, more just neural pathways going to that portion of their brain, or perhaps less damage over time to that portion of their brain, who knows. Um, but yeah, so there are definitely people with a physical perhaps reason a physiological reason why they can see ghosts or witness ghosts and of course there's if you've heard of clairvoyance you may or may not have heard of also clairaudience which is the ability to hear ghosts or clairsentience which is the ability to sense ghosts with like a sixth sense that's not quite visual or auditory um, people have different ways that they interact with the spirit world and or the supernatural which indicates that it's something in the brain that's connecting those two portions of the brain that allow you to feel haunted and pick up senses but anyway you can absolutely like becky said you can develop this and i personally think that the way you develop it is by accepting it as something that you embrace when you witness as opposed to something you brush off or ignore when you witness because that's what's true for me personally. I never tried to engage with the entity or, or presence in my basement when I was a kid. I'd run away from it. Or by the time I was a teenager, I'd just brush it off. I was just, just a dream. It's just a creepy dream. I'm a creepy kid. That's just my own interpretation of my dreams. And now as an adult who happens to be a ghost host, I spend a lot of time thinking 
well, but what if it was a ghost? What if what I'm witnessing is really a haunting? And since then, I've been able to kind of just change my mental outlook on the world of maybe I should trust when I have these very, very minor sensations with my senses. Maybe I should trust that that's something significant and not just a fluke. Yes, absolutely. And piggybacking on that, I think you're asking, you know, continuing to develop it. It's anything that you've heard about how to develop your own intuition would work for this as well. That trust, that trust, learning how to listen to your gut. People say that meditation is a huge part of this. Just making sure that you give yourself time to be silent and to have empty thoughts in your head and just be one with the universe. Yeah. <laughs> it, it helps you clear your mind and it helps you learn how to get to that point where you can sort of trust those feelings. And then, you know, you might just get a little bit, but then over time you get more and more and more and more because you're developing that trust with yourself. But at the very least, would you say that Tiffany and I, the next time we're together in Rome, should we go out walking in the middle of the night? No, I mean, be careful. It is Rome. Oh, <laughs> Rome is very quiet at night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, past a certain hour, it's very quiet. Okay. All right. All right. So not like 11 o'clock by the Spanish steps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think that you may have more experiences even during the day just being by yourself by yourselves together in say the Colosseum. If you could go there some point where there it's not very crowded. I don't know if there's ever a time when it's not crowded. Well, just during a pand worldwide pandemic. That's yeah. That's the only time. I'll do it. Yeah. I did get to experience it in June of 2020, but okay. this year it's not yeah, going to ever be quite empty. Also, just because something isn't famous doesn't mean it's not really haunted. Right. So there are probably all sorts of little nooks and crannies that most pe that aren't going to be crowded that right. a lot of people don't know about that you as somebody who lives there would be able to find and spend time in those places. Like just spend time by yourself trying to feel. On the bridge. Yeah. Spend time on that bridge. That bridge that uh, we talked about in the episode we did on your show, mm -hmm. Ponte Sant'Angelo, you know, I just remembered it's not just the place where, you know, Beatrice Cenci's ghost supposedly walks up and down on the night she died. But um, in the year 450, there was a, um, a holy year and there was a huge stampede across that bridge and it collapsed and like 500 people died right at the same moment because it was like it collapsed and people were um, trampled. So maybe we could go there, Katie. And like, if we don't get Beatrice Cenci, at least maybe we can get like some poor soul. Yeah. It, yeah. In the past, uh, when Tiffany has told that story, go back to other Halloween episodes about, or go to the, your show, actually, go to Homespun Haints and listen to this episode that we're on and you'll hear that story again. But I've always asked Tiffany, and have you been to that bridge on the night she's supposed to be walking with her head up and down the bridge? And she said, well, no. And I'm like, well, how could you not have tried to go? <laughs> right. I would block that off on my calendar a year in advance. Oh, my God. Yeah. Now I have to wait another year or so. So, yeah, I know I should do it. I should, I'm such I'm such an I'm not a night owl, you know, so, ah. so I'm usually a, in bed at that time of night, you know, by midnight. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I should do it just just for the sake of saying I tried. Well, we should yeah. pro we should probably bring it to an end. But. I actually have one last question. If people want to see a ghost, should they be expecting to see some guy in a bowler hat with a, you know, because it's always like, oh, some guy, he was dressed like in Victorian garb. He was stepping oh, out gosh. of a carriage. <laughs> <laughs> he was smoking a pipe. He looked like he was right off a farm. I mean, it's always like we're expecting to see a figure of a person standing there in vivid reality. I always feel like it's supposed they're supposed to be transparent. Yeah, like, but to me a ghost is transparent and you can't touch it. Like your hand goes through it. Like that's in my in my TV movie mind. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're they're different for everybody. I mean we've had all sorts of theories as like why they appear waist up or why they're like kind of transparent. Um I think the easiest way to see a ghost is to live or work 
in a haunted location. Because that day in, day out, getting used to your surroundings, getting comfortable with your surroundings. I mean, Diana and I have both worked in haunted offices. And you get to a point where you start noticing that, oh, yeah, that's a, that's not right. That's a ghost. But then you also get to a point where you're like so busy with work. You're like, okay, stop slamming that door. I'm working. <laughs> and <laughs> you have to leave. Yeah. 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 Can you just come back after hours? Oh my gosh. You're being so annoying. And, and, but, but I mean, truly that seems to be the best way to really experience something is being in the same place over and over and over again to where, and being there alone sometimes to where you just start noticing patterns that shouldn't be going on. You become comfortable with the space and the ghost becomes comfortable with you. Cause a lot of times, and you'll see this in shows on TV. It's so true. Like the hauntings ramp up over time. If you're in a haunted location, they don't start all at once. It's, it's like, oh, something's a little off. Oh yeah. That I thought I left that light on now it's off. And then, you know, three weeks later is when the ghost is like tearing down the chimney or something. <laughs> <laughs> pulling your blanket mm -hmm. off as you're sleeping. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> that is a good point. Yeah, yeah. Just just spending the most time there and also coming to the conclusion that whatever you see, if you don't have a ready explanation for it, bank it. Think about it later. You know, connect the dots because like I said, when I was first moving back into my childhood home, I wouldn't have necessarily said my basement was haunted because I didn't connect anything that had happened before um, until I started really being open to the idea of it and everything I witnessed, I would sort of catalog in my head. Oh, that's another clue. That's another clue. And nothing really, really, truly, I don't think any way has happened overtly. Mm -hmm. It's just tiny little things yeah, that add up. Time. Yeah. Or stay in a haunted bed and breakfast. That yeah. And I've, I've done three now. In well, even in, even in the States, I've stayed in three haunted bed and breakfast now and had experiences in every single one. So not me. Yeah, well, you, you come with me to Savannah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to reach out and get some tips on where to stay sometime in the future. Ooh, well, yes. this show is called the Homespun Haints. It's a delight, especially if you love ghost stories or if you want to listen to something late at night while you're taking a walk or uh, like you said, it's both creepy and funny and silly. And so it's it's got both elements. It's not just like all darkness. It's also light. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Becky and Diana. Thank you so much Thank for you. having us, Katie and Tiffany. This has been a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. It's been a blast for us, too. Yeah. And go seek out their show because we are going to be appearing on a show also uh, on their side. And you'll hear all of Tiffany's creepy stories about ghosts in Rome. So lots of fun there. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. And we'll leave it there. And until next time, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. And one final reminder. Today is the very last day to enter to win the most beautiful copy of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, a gold book covered in swans and flowers with a special secret inscription written to you by me and Tiffany, as well as one line underlined faintly in pencil, Tiffany's very favorite line in the entire book. This book is going to be shipped to you if you win our contest anywhere in the world. If you donate $5 or more to support this lovely podcast, you'll find links to donate in the show notes or visit thebittersweetlife.net and find links to donate through Patreon or PayPal. $5. This book is worth way more than $5, but it comes to you with our thanks if you throw your name in the raffle hat to win by donating $5 or more to the show. If you love this show, please do it. We'd love to have your name in the hat. Today's the last day. Join us again. Bye.